Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord God in heaven. Forgive us of our sins, Father, that we may come to your throne of grace with a righteous mind and a righteous heart, Father. And that we may lay these petitions at your feet, Father, that you may do your will with, with them, Father God in heaven. Again, I want to lift up our military to you, Father, and the military families for the sacrifices that they have given for this country and for you, Father God in heaven. I want to lift up all the servants of the church, of your body, Lord, of the kingdom of heaven, for the sacrifices that are made there also, Lord God in heaven. We know I want to lift up the first responders, and I want to lift up the officers, the police officers, Jesus. You know everybody who puts it on a line, you know, and we just ask, Jesus, that you would protect us. You would continue to pour into each and every one of us. And if there is a healing out there, Father God in heaven, that someone needs physically or financially or spiritually, Lord, we ask that you do a mighty work in our lives to do a mighty work through our lives. So we just thank you for that, Jesus. And we praise your holy name, Father God in heaven. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we just pray and say amen. Amen. So let's jump into the message. Today, we're going to continue on in the book of Hebrews, excuse me. In the book of Hebrews, and we're going to cover Hebrews chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. So it's a quasi-continuation of last week's message. Last week we covered verses 26 through 29. These are the last two verses in the final warning that the Hebrew author gives to those who live in continuous sin. And I... I separated these two verses because I think it's pointed to just focus on on what the Hebrew author is trying to tell us. He's trying to tell us several things. So today, uh, today's title of the message is this, God judges, God repays, let vengeance be his. So let's jump into it. How often do you try to make cake matters into your own hands. You know, are you one of these people that, you know, no one can do it better than you, not even God? If someone wrongs you, are you going to take matters into your own hand? Are you going to seek revenge or vengeance on your own terms? Or do you leave those things to the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father to take care of? Is your judgment more effective than God's? <clears throat> Because the vengeance and the judgment typically will play together. You know, they are not depend or they're not intended to be separated. So are you one of those people who try to do it in your own strength? Again, you know, take matters into your own hands, cast your judgments. Are they greater than what God can judge? Are they greater than what God will do? Do you know all things like God does? You know every aspect. So if you leave those things in his hands, then we must be assured through our faith that God will handle it appropriately and righteously because he is a righteous God and he will do the righteous things. You have a get even attitude. <clears throat> I'm going to get even with you, no matter what it takes, to my last breath. Or do you have a forgiveness in your heart for all things? Again, what do you leave for God to do, and what do you do on your own? And what do you want to do on your own? Do you realize that God, when he casts his judgment, when he applies his vengeance... There's nothing greater. And this does not suggest that God is a spiteful, hateful, mean God. This means that God's love and righteousness will adjudicate the right judgment and also apply the right vengeance with the right judgment. 
<clears throat> Do you believe that God will right the wrongs in your life if you have a repentant heart? If people or things come against you in life that are out of your control, do you think God, if you lay those burdens at his feet, do you think he'll make them right? Because of the love he has, because of the mercy, because of his grace? You know, remember this, and we've been talking through the book of Hebrews about this many, many, many weeks now, months, that God is love. Jesus is love. So through their love, the things that come against us, they will make righteous. And they will bless us if we take a hands-off approach. <clears throat> there are some things in the kingdom, in our walk with God, that he wants us to do the legwork with. Let's be clear about that. We just can't sit on a couch and let God handle all things we step out in faith, but we also, the petitions that we hand over to God in faith, we let God deal with. We dust our hands and we move on. Is God merciful, fair, and righteous? If you don't know the answer to those questions, you need to get into your Bible. And you need to really understand the attributes of God the Father, Jesus the Son. And understand that they are righteous. God is righteous. God is merciful. God is full of grace. And through the new covenant that is delivered. Do you believe God is a living God? This is a really hard question for a lot of people. A lot of people want to believe the written word is in print. Therefore, it's not living. But if we apply the word to our lives every single day, it lives in us. And God lives in us because God is the Word. And so when we stay in the Word, God stays in us. It's not a difficult equation or proposition to really understand. If we stay in our Word, then we're going to be protected always by the Word of God. And when things and problems come our way, we know exactly where to turn to handle them. And we can remove ourselves as difficult as it, it may be for some, for most, and maybe probably for all, to remove ourselves from the circumstance and let God deal with it completely. But this is the message, and this is part of the final warning from the Hebrew author that we learned about last week. Remember, continuous sin has consequences. And the author was warning us in verses 26 through now 31 of the consequences and how we should let God deal with those consequences. Let God be the judge. Let God be the one who applies the judgment. And let's stay out of it. Stay out of the fray. Again, you know, there are deep consequences for our continuous sin to the point where we will never see the kingdom of heaven if we stay in sin. Now, the good news is this, that God gives us an off-ramp. He gives us the ability to get off that sinful nature that we live in on that sinful road and get on to the road of righteousness. He provides that for us. And he reassures us if we stay on that path or decide to get on that path of righteousness. And we are obedient to him. He will keep us on that road to righteousness. Will we stumble? Will we fail? Yes, yes. Does God have mercy and grace? Yes, yes. Does God love us so much that he will pick us up? And he will build in us a righteousness, a discernment, where we'll eventually be able to stand on our own and understand what is right and wrong. Yes, he'll do that. If you are someone who is trampling, and remember, we discussed this last week, trampling the Son of God under your foot, if you're defiling 
the act of the cross, his blood, and you are downplaying it and you are dismissing it, you are living a very dangerous life. And again, these last two scripture that we're going to cover today really is the culmination or the peak of the warning that the Hebrew author gives us. And again, in context, you have a Hebrew society, a Jewish society in the first century that were converting to Christianity, but they were getting a downward pressure from society, from the Pharisees, from the synagogue to renounce Jesus and go back to Judaism, go back to what they've been taught their whole life. And the warning the author gives them is do not renounce Jesus because the consequence for not knowing, knowing, and rejecting is very great. So this week, we're going to talk about the forgiveness of your deliberate sin and that if you continuously sin, deliberately, God's judgment is going to be harsh. God is not a harsh uh, God, though. He is not harsh. He's full of love. And this is a message not of harshness, but it's a message of God's love, the love that God has for each and every one of us. That's why it would be easier or better. And we're going to learn this David actually quotes this, but we'll get to that when we get into Scripture. It would be better to be judged by God than judged by man in certain circumstances because man has no mercy in most cases. But God is merciful. There's no better place for vengeance to be handled, we mention this, than God handling it for us. A, it keeps us out of trouble. A, it keeps us focused on, or B, it keeps us focused on God. So if we know this and we practice this, then we are truly putting God before our own needs or wants or desires, and we're truly letting God lead us, lead our lives, and letting God go before us to handle all our circumstances. So let's pick up Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30, and we're going to cover two verses, verse 30 and verse 31 today. And let's see what it says. I'm reading out of the New King James Version, so if you have a different version, please follow along. And verse 30, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. In Hebrews 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So these are the last two warnings. So let's pick up in 30. It says, for we who know him said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. So let's, pick, let, let's break this down for a minute. Vengeance. The Greek word is edikesis. And it means to repay harm with harm on the assumption that the initial harm was unjustified and that the retribution is therefore called for, to pay back, to revenge, to seek retribution, retribution, seeking retribution. And let's look at what Deuteronomy says. And this is where the Hebrew author is pulling the vengeance is mine, scripture from the Old Testament. And Deuteronomy 32, 35, vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. So God is very clear that he wants to take control. He wants to protect us. He wants to allow us to live in that. Um, safe place in the kingdom. He wants us to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, but he does not want us to be 
leading the charge of taking vengeance. Because he clearly states, God clearly states this, vengeance is his and his alone. God will judge those who come against his people. And that's a promise that he makes. But God also promises, if you continuously sin, he will take vengeance against that also. So it's not a free pass that God gives us because we're believers. You know, um, if you live in continuous sin, we believe, therefore, we must start to live the life that God gave us. We must do that. We must be very clear that that's the expectation God gives us. But we shouldn't go out and we shouldn't take matters into our, our own hands. Romans twelve nineteen says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Again, Paul pulls back from Deuteronomy and says the same thing. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. And that's, uh, you know, the warning that we're talking about here. Don't take matters into your own hands. Lay those problems at your feet. And again, this is what the Hebrew author is telling those who are taking, uh, getting downward pressure or, you know, uh, things happening to them and their families. And, you know, God is just saying, let me deal with it. You're my children. I will deal with it. This is what Paul is saying also. Let the Lord deal with those people who come against his children. But conversely, let or be aware of God's wrath or judgment if you are doing the things against his son, against him, blaspheming him. Just beware. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 36 as a continuation from 35. For the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants. When he sees that their power is gone and there is no one remaining, bond or free. So what, do, what is Moses telling us in Deuteronomy? He's saying that he has compassion for us, for his servants. And he will righteously show that compassion. But only when we are empty of the power of, of the things that, you know, God does not want us to keep hold of. And there is no one remaining, bond or free. And that is something very important to understand. God will take care of it. He will do a complete job for us and against us. Again, you know, this is a duplicit message. So let's think about this duplicitly. If we are continuously sinning, God will judge. If people are sinning against us, God will judge. Because he is righteous, he will judge accordingly. So let's look at verse 31. It is fearful. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the fear that the author is talking about here is not to be afraid of God, but to reverence Him and to understand that the fear should be in living in continuous sin and what that judgment will be like because God is righteous and we know he will judge every sin. We know that. We know that to be. So we have to be cautious and we have to really look at the things in our lives and the warning that we've been given. And there are many other warnings in the Bible that we can lean on to say, get out of your sin. Get out of the continuous sin every day. We are warned, if you read your scripture every day, you will come across something 
that addresses, especially in the New Testament, that addresses the sin in your life, that gives you a plan to remove the sin in your life or the process of removing the sin in your life. Those things occur in the Bible. So let's look at uh, what Luke says in 12.5, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. And it's daunting to think about this. Does God have the power to kill? Yes, he has the power to kill. And yes, he has the power to cast you into the lake of fire. Does he do that? No. We do it to ourselves. Sin in our lives allows us to die to deaths if we continue to have the same sin in our lives. We will have two deaths. We've talked about this in the past, and it is so true and evident. And will he throw you into the lake of fire if you are not a believer in the kingdom of heaven? No, God doesn't put us into the lake of fire or cast us into hell. We do that to ourselves by the choices we make. But it's very pointed here that Luke says he has the power to do it. And if you continue to come against God and you continue to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you know, there will be a consequence. And only God knows that consequence for your life, for my life. It doesn't matter. Let's look at Isaiah 33, 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us? shall dwell with everlasting burnings. And again, Isaiah is addressing the Israelites now. The sinners in Zion are afraid. The fear that they have seized the hypocrites. So the hypocrites now are afraid of the judgment because the message is very clear. Continue to sin against the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. And you know what? There will be a consequence. And it's through God's love, not through, you know, his ability to do these things or to cast judgments or to, you know, place vengeance in his own kingdom. It is through his love that we should understand that he's righteous and we have sinned, and we refuse to release the sin. We refuse to take the steps necessary to rid ourselves of the sin. We refuse to allow the Holy Spirit in our lives to remove that sin. The Lord Jesus Christ will come in our lives through the Holy Spirit and start to sanctify us. And this is the warning. 2 Samuel, I mentioned this, 24, 14, And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. Now again, this is David's sin against God. God gave him a command. And David, in his mind, were thinking about the choices God had for his judgment. But then what he does, David pulls back and says, I would rather have God judge me than fall into the hand of man. And what is he saying here? He's saying that God's judgment is going to be filled with mercy. The judgment of man, David feared would be death. And David knew it, actually. He not only feared it, but he knew it. This is why he cried out to God. This is why he was distressed, because he did not know if God's judgment would include giving him over to man and letting man judge him. But we know God is a loving God. We know God is a merciful God, and God is full of grace. So David said, Lord, because of your mercy, because of your grace, I would rather have you judge me. 
And this is the crux of the message, uh, of the warning, of these two verses. This really elevates God to a, a place where we can see He is righteous. We can see He will judge. We can see that He will take vengeance on those who come against Him and in those who come against His people. We can see those things through this scripture. So let's um, look at a couple of encouraging verses here. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, and 7. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So the righteousness, and Paul's telling us in 2 Thessalonians, through God's righteousness, he will pray, repay, with tribulation. Those who come against us. Now, we don't know what that repayment looks like, but we do know this, that God will repay. And we need to be in a place in the kingdom with God, in our relationship with God, that we'll be okay with whatever God, however God judges, and whatever God does for those who come against us. Our faith this is where faith is really needs to be strong. We need to trust in the Lord that He will take care of us. And His vengeance will be good enough for us. And we, ha we should be receiving that and respecting it. And verse 7, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. And again, this is talking about Jesus coming down, and we see Satan finally the end of his uh, reign. And this is what we need to do when someone comes against us, when we are being persecuted. We need to know that God is in control and God will handle and fight our battles. Again, we go back to, you know, we cannot fight flesh with sp against spirit. We will never win that battle. Flesh will never win. This is why we call on the kingdom of heaven. We call on God to fight our battles, to take upon himself the vengeance, to repay on our behalf. This is where we start to develop a stronger relationship with Christ. Our faith grows because we, we will see. But we should not, and this is a warning to us, we should not go to God with a heart that says you want to see bad things happening to people who come against you because that is not the love of God that is poured into us. The love of God that pours into us suggests that God I'm putting these problems in your hand, and I know through your scripture, through De Deuteronomy uh, 32, 35, and 36, that A, vengeance is yours, and B, you will judge. You will judge your children. You will judge the enemies of your children. And this is what we have to keep in mind and focus on. Luke six twenty seven and 28, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. And this is hard to do. I was preaching to some men yesterday about this very topic, the love that God pours into us. You know, one of the commandments that God gives us is to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, as Christ loves the church, that love of God. But it's really hard to love your enemies when they're coming against you. Do good to those who hate you. How hard is it? Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. It's really hard to do those things, but if you do this, then you are giving all of those things that are coming against you over to the Lord. 
and he is taking them on because he promises us that he will avenge us. And he promises us that he will repay. And that's what we have to stay focused on. And if we do, we are in a better place than what the world perceives we should do and how we should avenge ourselves or our families or our friends if we let God do that. But again, the warning here is not only against the enemies of Christ, it's against the Israelites. It's against us when we willfully sin. And it's a harsh warning. It's a harsh message. But again, sinning against God is harsh. And continuously sinning against God is very harsh. Because it will end up not boding well for us. The conclusion to that action and that behavior is dire. And, and the author of Hebrews puts out a very stern warning. This is a very, very stern warning. But we need to heed it. We need to meditate on it and understand it. Because without these types of warnings, we will go off thinking that we can just live life the way it was after we give our life to Christ. And it's not the case. And let me go back to a, a quick story on uh, some comments I made yesterday to the men that I was preaching to. You know, I, I gave the example of loving your neighbor, exactly what Luke is telling us here. You know, love your enemies, love those who come against us. And I, and I gave this, uh, you know, I laid out this story that, you know, you have a friend or you have an acquaintance that really likes you and really, you know, hey, gives you money all the time to do things. And, you know, you feel like you have the love of, of God in you. So you're befriending him. You're doing, you're going out of your way to do things. And then all of a sudden the money stops coming. Your friend you know, your friend doesn't want to pay anymore to do things, you know, um, for some reason, the money dries up. And my question to the men were, what then? Do you still love that person? Do you still want to show your love? And the question is, what did you really love? Did you love the money? Or did you love your friend like God asked us to? Do you love your enemies like God asks us to? And it's a hard question to answer because a lot of times in a relationship, it's always give and take. Well, not a lot of times, all the time, a relationship is give and take. But if you are always taking and then all of a sudden there's nothing more to take, do you still feel the same way about that person? You did when there was an abundance of of gifts and, and monies. And that's a question you have to ask yourself because that does not show the love of God. The love of God says this, love your enemies, do good things to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you. And that's what we need to do and that's the warning of the author of, of Hebrews. In verses 30 and 31. So let's conclude. Let's talk about this. When we try to take matters into our own hands, it rarely will create an outcome that benefits all. And what does that mean, that benefits all? You know, when God blesses us, He'll bless many. If we take matters into our own hands, it may not bless any. And that's one of the things that we have to be cautious of. That's why we always leave those matters in God's hands. Because like it or not, if God, if we call God to take on his role, then there may be blessings for everybody. And we have to be good with that. And the greatest blessing we can see is our enemies turning away from the world and coming into the kingdom of heaven. 
That's the blessing. That's the true blessing that we will see. Every time someone who has a hard heart and God will work in their lives and God will soften that heart and they turn to the kingdom of heaven, we should rejoice because we know God did a mighty work in their lives. And we know this, that God's power is real and God's power is true. And through our prayer, our faith gets reinforced and grows. God's mercy and grace that we, that can, we uh, find forgiveness in him and others. Through God's mercy and grace, we can find forgiveness in him and in others. God does not remain angry if we have a repentant heart. He just won't. When we repent, he forgets all the sins through that repentant heart. God is love, mercy, grace, long-suffering, kind, caring, who will take care of you for the rest of your days. Let's look at Micah 7.18. Who is a God like you, hardening iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. And he won't. But the key to allowing God to delight in his mercy is to have a repentant heart. Who is God? Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity. Forgiving us of our sins is what he's saying in Micah. Passing over the transgression, passing over the sin of the past sins. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and we ask, seek forgiveness. So let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, for your message today. We just want to again lift up all the military, all the servants in the kingdom of heaven, all the first responders, all the doctors, all the officers, police officers, firemen, Lord God in heaven, please bless them. But Lord, also, please resonate this message in our hearts, Father God in heaven, that uh, through your strength, when we give over the things that come against us to you, Father God in heaven, you will handle them. You will handle them in a righteous way. Your judgment is greater than our judgment. Your vengeance is greater than our vengeance. But we also must be cautioned, Father, that if we stay in the sin of this world, then there will be a judgment against us, and there will be um, a consequence for our sins. So, Father, release us of those things. Father, etch in our minds this message that we may know you, we may understand what's expected of us, Father God, as we move forward in the kingdom of heaven. So if you allow me, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, bring to my mind those things you want me to remember. Lord, bring to my heart those things you want to change in me. And Lord, bring to my lips the words you want me to speak for the rest of my days. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray and thank you and give you all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you. Have a wonderful, safe Memorial Weekend. Enjoy your family. Share the love of God with all that you come in contact with this weekend. It's been a rough year for everybody. And let's just pray that God will protect us, will provide for us, will heal us. And let us pray that we give over those things to the Lord so we can step away and we can allow God to do his mighty work and bless those who need the blessing.
Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Have a great day.